Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Let's just do this. Anybody have a message Bible? You do. Good. Not yet. I just set you up. You just didn't know it. I didn't tell you, but. <laughs> Romans chapter 5. May I say something? Yes, you can. I don't mean to interrupt or take any of your time. But I just, all, ever since I came in, the Holy Spirit's been speaking to me. I, can you hear me? Yeah. I saw the Holy Spirit. Yeah. This is a special day. Because you came today. You entered into some blessings that God has coming your way. There's just some really special things coming your way because you entered these doors today. And this place is going to be known as a place where love lives. And when people walk through the door, Hmm. they're going to know the love of Jesus. They're going to feel it when they come through the doors. And, Pastor, God's going to do a work in you that's incredible. He's going to give you the confidence and his courage and his boldness that you will be willing to run into hell with a fly swat. You know, you just, when it, you just there's a, a newness coming on you. And for um, the choir, I saw the choir bulging. I saw musicians coming. Mm-hmm. And, I just, and there's just going to be a real move of God's spirit here. And it's not going to be same old, same old church service. The, every m- member that's on the staff moves in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The, he's going to be preaching and just stop one day and say, hey, you're being healed of cancer, and they're being gone. You're going to see these things because we want to let God move in this house. There's not very many houses he's allowed to move in. You know, there's a... a, a a list of what can be done and what can't be done. Mm-hmm. Well, like Shirley, what was wrong? Shirley Caesar said, well, hold my mule. God will dance. <laughs> you know, just do whatever God wants you to give free. This is a place of freedom. This is not some place where somebody's going to smack you down and say you're out of order because this is a place where love lives. Yeah. And um, I just can't wait to see the bulging manifest that I saw up there in that choir. I saw it bulging, mm. just bulging, and uh, musicians galore. Amen. 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 And next week, we're going to have a baptismal service right here on that baptismal tank. Amen. So, right? Ready? How many of you have never been baptized and you desire to be baptized? Would you just raise your hand real quickly for me so we'll know to keep count? How many of there are? I know there's some. Rocky told me about some. Ready to be baptized next Sunday? One. Up there? Oh, yeah, two. Good. Anybody else? McKenzie. Yeah, that's good. Three. So we'll have a handful of baptisms next week. So prepare for that. Be right there. And how are we going to do the tree? That's right. The pre will part right down the middle. <laughs> Romans chapter 5. And C did. Romans chapter 5. I did hear the Lord say when she was talking, though, that there's some people in here that have loved ones that are incarcerated, and I heard the Lord say that there's going to be some early releases um, for some of those people. And the reason I heard the Lord say that, I don't know who you are, but I heard the Lord say that is because there are some people also that's spiritually in prison, and the Lord said there's going to be some really early releases for you, too. Okay? You've been confined in a religious system, and you've been afraid And this is for some people's friends and family members, some spouses that are here, that you're here right now, that your spouse is not here. And they've been confined in the spirit because of some past hurt religious experience from a church, and they don't trust, okay? And it goes back for even decades. Maybe it's parents, even, that your parents have been just kind of, I don't have anything to do with that, but the Lord is going to erase all of that hurt from their mind, and they're going to have a want to again to be involved and engaged in an active body. And as that begins to happen, the religious system is going to be clearly defined on the one side and the reality of the body of Christ is going to be on another. And you're going to be able to see it so opposite one another that you'll see one is fake and one is real. And the real won't be pointing out the fake. 
because the real won't have time to worry about the fake. Does that make sense? We're not going to be worried about all this over here going, oh, that's the real. That's, no, they're not the, no, we don't have time for that. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a distraction. We're just going to have to be who we are. Which means there's going to be people getting healed. There's going to be people getting delivered. There's going to be people getting set free. There are people going to get saved. And some of your family members and friends that have gone way off the deep end for years and once had a walk with the Lord are going to come back in a rapid pace. Hallelujah. Rapid pace. And you're not going to take, be able to take credit for it because you ain't going to do anything to make it happen. It's just going to be the Spirit of God moving on them. And you're just going to happen to be there one day and go, Wait a minute, like my, my dad appeared in church last Sunday. I mean, he was here last Sunday or there, where we were there. He was there, here, no, there, there, it was there. I looked back and there he was. I knew he might be coming, but he came. And my dad hadn't been to church. He'd been to church a couple times when the kids did things, but he wouldn't come to church because, you know, when I grew up, and he's not here so I can say this story, when I grew up, we were not have a TV, but we had one anyway. My dad was not saved. My mom was really saved. <laughs> in a real strong upbringing in Pentecostal church. So the TVs were known as monitors in those days, and you couldn't watch TV, and you couldn't go to ball games. Well, my dad wasn't saved. So I got the best of both worlds. I got church on Sunday, but I got a ball game on a Sunday afternoon. <laughs> right? So there was a lot of that going on. Well, that confusion was years gone by, and now today we've worked through a lot of that, and today we're going to be able to walk this thing out in reality. People need to know how to live a life that's not perfect but led by the one that is. Amen. Right? Yes. Leading a life that is not perfect, but led by the one that is perfect. We have to be able to walk this thing out together. I'm going to read. Uh, you, I'm going to have you, you. I want you to. I've got it on here. I want you to read it. <laughs> Romans chapter 5. In verse 1, we're going to read the whole chapter. We're going to go somewhere today. Everybody ready? Romans 5, whole chapter in the Message Bible. That's not heresy. No, it's not. Go ahead. By entering through faith into what God has always wanted to do for us, set us right with him, make us fit for him. We have it all together with God because of our master Jesus. And that's not all. We throw open our doors to God and discover at the same moment that he has already thrown open his door to us. We find ourselves standing where we always hoped we might stand, out in the wide open spaces of God's grace and glory, standing tall and shouting our praise. There's more to come. We continue to shout our praise even when we're hemmed in with troubles because we know how troubles can develop passionate patience in us and how that patience in turn forges the tempered steel of virtue, keeping us alert for whatever God will do next. An alert expectation such as this, we've never left feeling shortchanged. Quite the contrary. We can't round up enough containers to hold everything God generously pours into our lives through the Holy Spirit. Christ arrived, arrives right on time to make this happen. He didn't and doesn't wait for us to get ready. He presented himself for this sacrificial death when we were far too weak and rebellious to do anything to get ourselves ready. And even if we hadn't been so weak, we wouldn't have known what to do anyway. We can understand someone dying for a person worth dying for, and we can understand how someone good and noble could inspire us to selfless sacrifice. But God put his love on the line for us by offering his son in sacrificial death while we were of no use whatsoever to him. Now that we are set right with God by means of this sacrificial death, the consummate blood sacrifice, there is no longer a question of being at odds with God in any way. If when we were at our worst, we were put on friendly terms with God by the sacrificial death of his son, now that we're on our best, just think of how our lives will expand and deepen by means of his resurrection life. Now that we have actually received this amazing friendship with God, we are no longer content to simply say it, in plotting prose, we sing 
and shout our praises to God through Jesus, the Messiah. You know the story of how Adam landed us in the dilemma we're in. First sin, then death. And no one exempt from either sin or death. That sin disturbed relations with God and everything and everyone. But the extent of the disturbance was not clear until God spelled it out in detail to Moses. So death, this huge abyss separating us from God, dominated the landscape from Adam to Moses. Even those who didn't sin precisely as Adam did by disobeying a specific command of God still had to experience this termination of life, this separation from God. But Adam, who got us into this, also points ahead to the one who will get us out of it. Yet the rescuing gift is not exactly parallel to the death-dealing sin. If one man's sin put crowds of people at the dead-end abyss of separation from God, just think what God's gift poured through one man, Jesus Christ, will do. There's no comparison between the death-dealing sin and this generous life-giving gift. The verdict on that one's sin was this death sentence. The verdict on the many sins that followed was this wonderful life sentence. If death got the upper hand through one man's wrongdoings, can you imagine the breath, the upper hand through one man's, the breath taking recovery life makes sovereign life in whose, those whose gasp with both hands this wildly extravagant life gift, this grand setting everything right that the one man Jesus Christ provides. Here it is in a nutshell. Just as one person did it wrong and got us all in trouble with sin and death, another person did it right and got us out of it. Hmm. But more than getting us out of trouble, he got us into life. Yeah. One man said no to God and put many people in the wrong. One man said yes to God and put many people in the right. Amen. All that passing laws against sin did was produce more lawbreakers. But sin didn't and doesn't have a chance in competition with the aggressive forgiveness that we call grace. When it's sin versus grace, grace wins hand to, hands down. All sin can do is threaten us with death. And that's the end of it. Grace, because God is putting everything together again through the Messiah, invites us into a life, a life that goes on and on and on, world without end. Amen. Wow. Isn't that powerful? We could probably just go ahead and go downstairs and have the rest of those Krispy Kreme donuts if we wanted after, some, after reading that. Hey, this is, this is powerful. This is powerful. This in a nutshell. When we quit fear and faith, quit fear and sin, and have more confidence in God's grace, and have faith in the grace, and less in the fear of failure and sin, grace will have its perfect work in our life. What we have raised up, and I want you to think about this for a moment, what we have raised up in the church world and most of us in our lives have, fit, have worried is that we're so worried about sin that we have failed to realize the faith that we should have in the more potent gospel and grace of God and the God's word. God's resurrected power in Jesus is greater than Adam's failure in sin in the Garden of Eden. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, how you see that determines everything. If you see it, fear of failure is harder and more concerned and on your mind daily than it is to try to get up here and what God has already done and paid the price for. If you see this is a wonderful opportunity for somebody else to take, but yet I'm battling with my situation every day. When your situation eclipses the grace of God, then your situation is your God. Does that make sense? We got, to, we got to make the shift, because here's what was happening. It's Christmas season. There was a birthing coming in Jesus coming in the day of 2,000 years ago. The, the landscape was already set. The plot was already made. Jesus was coming in the fullness of time. 
They heard he was coming. They heard he was coming. We keep hearing today he's coming back. He's coming back. We know that he's coming back. But just as then people missed him when he came, I'm concerned that people are going to miss him when he comes. If you're looking for him to come one day, he will come. But if you don't know that he's coming through you before he comes for you, you're going to miss he's even here. He's coming through you before he comes for you. He came to you. Now he's coming through you, and then he's going to come back for you. But he came to you, and now we're in the stage of life where he's coming through you. So if you're looking from 2,000 years ago that he came to us, the next time something great will happen is when he comes for us, you're going to miss the life you're supposed to be living when he comes through you. And we've done this halftime pause, and I've said this before, but we're in this commercial break from 2,000 years ago, pre-Jesus, to now living in hell until Jesus comes back to get us out of our hell that we're living in. And that's not how this is supposed to be. You, learn, you have to learn to hear, H-E-A-R, learn to hear that he's coming before you learn to see, hear he is coming, H-E-R-E. You have to learn to hear he's coming. And how he comes is through you and he comes through me. He's not on the sidelines. He's actively involved in your life. 2,000 years ago, the children of Israel were in a mess. They were disconnected from God. Romans chapter 5, the very beginning of that chapter says, we were separated from God. We were in our sin. We were dead in our trespasses. We couldn't see a way out. We only hope we had was one day this Messiah had to come and get us out of our mess that we were in. And they kept waiting, waiting, waiting. He's coming, he's coming, he's coming. When is he coming? And when he came, they thought he was coming to set up a kingdom right here on the earth to dethrone government, to dethrone the Roman government, get them out of position so Jesus and his 12 guys and the rest of the people could set up a legitimate government right here on the earth and run it just like the Romans did. But because the people were looking something so literally, they didn't discern the times that they were living in and they missed him coming spiritually and they still missed the moment of their visitation. So an entire nation of people were looking for Jesus to come he was in their midst, and Jesus would be standing up on the mountains going, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how many times would I love to pick you up like a mother would pick up her, her chicks, a like mother hen would pick up her chicks. I want to pull you to myself. There's things that I have for you. I'm doing things for you. I prepared things for you. But because you won't receive me or understand that it's me you're looking for is in your midst, you're going to postpone your moment. The church is in their moment. For the last two terms of presidency for the last one decade or two decades since 9-11 the church has been restless frustrated not voting not involved subject to the economic crashes of the of, of the world watching things happen victimized but inside we've been frustrated and wrestling and we begin praying again and people begin moving again so the last couple of years, there's been this resurgence of we're going to put prayer back in schools, or we're going to have prayer back in our events, or we're going to put prayer back here, we're going to start reading the Word again, and people are starting to defy some of the things they know were not right when they were taken off the shelf. And people are standing in face of them now going, we're going to do that anyway. I'll take the consequences, and I'm ready for the fight. The church hasn't been willing to fight because we hadn't known what we were even fighting because we were fighting internally, fighting each other. And now for the last couple of years, the church is saying, it's time to wake up. It's time to rise up. So we get a little bit of trickling of some good things happening. The church goes, we've been praying, gas prices start coming down. The economics start changing a little bit. And some people, depending on what political landscape side you fall on, you begin to think, oh, there's some swing going on the political thing. The church is notorious in times past to when we see a little bit of motivation or success, we let our guard down and think we've done our job. And we sit back now idle while we let everything take place because we had a real good insurgence from the beginning and now we get complacent. I just described to you many people that get saved. I've described to you many people that are living in the church world today. We had a moment of time when it was good. We hit something that we think is going to be good for a while or we hit something that's not so good and we shut down in our moment. And we shut down because we think we'll either ride the coaster and let it go where it goes, or 
We're so hurt and damaged that we're so full of ourselves that we don't have any get up and go and fight anymore. I'm telling you, prophetically, that we are living in the greatest moment this country's history has ever seen. The church is living in the greatest moment than we have ever lived in the history, in the history of the country, 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 country. <laughs> We're living in the moment. This is our time. This is our, this is our time. We're going to be more challenged but we're going to be more victorious. Now, here's how this works. If we don't get an understanding of two things, we're going to fight a carnal battle and lose a spiritual war. If we don't understand the true love of God and the reality of God's grace, we're going to miss our moment. The visitation of the Lord in the church today isn't the Left Behind series. It's not that one day we're going to stand here and gaze and hope Jesus comes back and raptures us out of this place, even though I believe that Jesus is coming back. I believe he's coming back. I don't have time to stand here and watch for him because if he doesn't come tomorrow, I've got a work to do. We've got children that are downstairs that Pat's pouring his heart into right now to teach them some foundational principles because one day they're going to be sitting in a pew. And the last thing we want is them to grow up still looking for Jesus and not get any foundational principles, know how to live life. Not plan for the future and have retirement. Right? Not know how to live actively, know how to, to search out a, a spouse instead of having to repair five marriages. How come we just can't prepare for one? Not damaging the people that have gone through divorces. That's not the issue. But do we always have to be in the repair mode as a body of Christ? Can we not shift over till we're preparing people rather than always pre repairing people? Amen. I'm okay for repair. But somewhere along the line, once you repair and restore, we've got to prepare and prepare for people to come as a generation raises up because somewhere along the line, we've got to know how to live in victory we got to know how to live when things are on top, not always on the bottom. we got to know how it's okay to live clean, not always having to try to get out underneath an addiction. We've got to know how to live for freedom and responsibility and know how to get this thing working where we, we got a job that's successful, things are working well, rather than try to always have to figure like how are we going to get climbed to, to the corporate top. How do we do this? How can we move people to live in a place of flowing in the Spirit of God, hearing His voice, doing what God said to do, living this thing out, not afraid to succeed, not focused constantly on failing. Sometimes we're so caught up in the drama of emotional messes that we don't even know how to live in a peaceful mind. We, we get peaceful in our heads sometimes and then we have to figure out how to find a drama to get involved in because if we get involved in somebody else's drama, it gives us a sense of purpose. Can our purpose be not always in somebody else's drama or creating drama for ourselves? Can our purpose really truly be living in the fruitful life of Christ? Are we okay with that? Because we've got to shift a body to learn how to not get caught up in the dysfunction of society, thinking we're going to go fix this dysfunction of society when we've got to learn how to live in a peaceful mind from a victorious standpoint. Jesus didn't go run when Lazarus died. But if Mary and Martha would have lived in this day, they would have rebelled, quit church, cast him down, called him every name in the book because he didn't get caught up in their emotional mess. He was moved with compassion, but he did not let their situation and that dysfunction knock him off of his square and his mission and purpose. His mission and purpose incorporated their dysfunction, but their dysfunction did not incorporate his purpose. Are we okay with that? How do we get a society back in balance and in life, living in a futuristic life that is living in victorious, living and outside of themselves, living in an outlook that says we're going to win this thing, we're coming from a place of victory, or do we have to have people always over here? Do we feel so good? About, is the church's role only to get people out of our mess, or are we to establish some things for people that do not have to live in a mess?
Am I, right? Am I going to just switch this? That's affected me probably it is more than anybody else. Are, are you hearing what I'm saying? We've got to get to the place and to the point where we are living victorious. We see life through victorious eyes. And anything that comes against us that drags us down doesn't cause the rug to be pulled out from under us and us to fall flat on our face. If we get a loss, we get a disappointment, we get a setback, we get something that doesn't work the way we should, we have to know that that's not the norm. The norm is victory. We have to see victory and we have to live from victory. And if we don't have victory, we know that's not the norm. We got to keep going until victory comes. I'm just telling you that we're going to... The thing's going to shift in 24 months. It's going to, over the next 24 months, you're going to see the entire nation shift. Where the church is going to be in a position to have influence and power. And we're going to be in a position where people of the world are going to be looking to you and to me and to us. Not just this church. I'm talking about the body of Christ and you individually. From business to economics to family to education, every aspect of society... The world is going to look to us to see how we're going to handle the success and the voice that's been given to us. And is the voice going to be coming from a place that liberates other people, or are we going to be so disconnected with the problems that people have that we can't even speak into their life because we're so far ahead of them or so far disconnected from them? And we've got to be able to relate to people in the midst of the situation, like Rocky, for example, I'm not p- picking on Rocky, but let's just take Rocky for a second. Rocky number two. So we got Rocky here. Rocky's life is moving forward. Man, he's doing incredibly, incredible in his life, doing wonderful. Great things are happening for him. So now Rocky is here. When is it that Rocky has to be able to see his life, not from where he used to see it, recognizing that where he once was is not where he is now, but he has established new memories and new life to where that past life is so distant that he can trust himself and be trusted with living a life of success. Can the church be trusted if the keys of the kingdom truly have been given to the church in 2015? Or do we have to lose the keys and always have to have a fight to go get them because we're better off in the fight than we are with the victory? Can you live without the fight, and can you live from a place of a posture of victory? If you can't make that change, you'll always be running, chasing yourself. And it comes down to one thing, Romans chapter 5. I know Romans 7 and 8 say something even better, but Romans 5 says it this way. While we were yet in our, dead in our trespasses and sins... That man's fall from grace created an incredible problem for all humankind. It was so bad that man had no way out of the hole that he had created. And by one man's sin, an entire generation and generations and generations and generations were affected by one man that made the bad call. But thanks be unto God that one man's right call supersedes one man's bad call. And if we're not living in the church as Jesus Christ as the head, then we're living Jesus Christ as our Savior, but Adam's still our Lord. Adam's sin caused all man to to fail. Jesus died, resurrected, called all man to succeed. Jesus saves us. But if Adam is your daily living, Adam's your Lord. Jesus saves, Adam's your Lord. Can you trust Jesus in his victory in, as, as much as you can trust him in his death? Is the power of grace good enough to keep you from failing? Or do we have to have Adam's interjection to get us in a mess so Jesus can get us out of our mess? Are you more comfortable in our problem, or do we have to have not, can we live without a problem and still live in victory? And how you see it is how it is. In your heart, 
is Jesus' victory greater than Adam's defeat? If it's just, I think so, then it's not settled. If it becomes a living reality, everything that comes against you, even your defeats, cannot compare to God's victory in Jesus Christ. So when you get up against a situation, you won't be afraid to fail because even if you fail, his greatest success is getting your defeat out of victory or failure into victory. If while he didn't know you and you didn't know him, he died, how much more now that he knows you and you know him can you succeed? Why is the pressure on us today to live this thing out making right decisions when we didn't have any pressure making bad decisions? The pressure wasn't from the bad decisions. The pressure resulted because of the bad decisions. But we never woke up every morning going, do we do good or do we do bad? Is this an eternal situation here? What I'm telling you this morning, that we as a church and you as an individual, we have to get to is we cannot fall into the trap of the Israelites 2,000 years ago. We are living in a moment in time where you cannot fail unless you stay in your failure. It's impossible for you to fail unless you stay in your failure. If you are able to fail by staying in your failure, but you have confidence in his victory, the faith in his victory is greater than your failure. Is this too hard to believe? Is the, new, is the good news too hard to, to believe? Is it too good to be true? It is, but it's true. Some of you are believing for things in your life, and you're thinking, how can I make this, how does this work? How do I, you know, I, I, I'm afraid to make a decision. If you have fear in your life, where you are right now, in your setting, then Adam is your Lord. Those are tough, aren't they? Isn't that tough to say? But if you have faith in the victory, then Jesus Christ is not only your Savior, but he's your Lord. Can you believe in the gospel enough that nothing you can do disqualifies you? But you don't know what I did yesterday. I know, but it's not greater than his victory. It's not greater than his overcoming. I feel like we've got this life that we're living, and I think we're all there, is that we're climbing up this ladder of life, and, and it gets tough sometimes the harder you climb and the higher you climb, and you're going, gosh, and you, you look back and you're thinking, man, I've come a long way. I'm not who I used to be. And all of a sudden, sometimes you'll feel this slipping of your fingers, and you go, oh, and and sometimes you might just fall down one rung or two rungs, and, and sometimes you feel like, man, i got to go all the way back down to the bottom and climb this thing up again. You just start all over again. Here we go. Just keep climbing. All the while, it's all built on your effort to not fall off the ladder. I'm telling you that God has such a plan for you that if you'll quit focusing on your shortcomings and your weaknesses... And, co- over and start thinking on his victory and his strength, then you'll not think about falling, not falling off the ladder. All you'll see is he's guiding your steps on the ladder. Am I making sense to anybody in here today? There has got to be a shift in our mind thinking because we're so focused on not succeeding and we're afraid of failing. And I have this internal conflict inside of my heart because I'm seeing an entire nation of people that are going to be in power. The church isn't going to be impotent any longer. The church is going to be potent 
full of influence, and very persuasive in the next couple of years. We're going to be a voice that even the news people are going to listen to, the church world. The, the voice of God is going to be very amplified in the years, in the, in the months to come. The world is going to look to us to have the answers. And if we give them an answer that points them back to humanity, we're setting them up to fail just like we have on times past. We've got to be able to have an answer by discerning of the Spirit of God, trusting that God's victory is greater than anybody's defeat. And we have got to learn from, to lead from a posture of victory and freedom and responsibility and making right choices as opposed to always having to have a battle that puts us on our back that we have to get up and fight and fight and fight. Can you live, Solomon, in a reign of peace or do you have to be like David and worship in a time of war? David fought his entire kingdom. Solomon fought no battles. David was a man of war. Solomon was a man of rest. David worshipped in war. Solomon built a temple in rest. Wisdom flows from rest. We are not going to be able to live this life as complicated as it is without the wisdom and the spirit of Almighty God. And you're not going to gain wisdom wrestling with the flesh you gain wisdom by resting in the Spirit. And how you gain wisdom by resting in the Spirit is you have to settle some things in your heart and begin to live from as opposed to always trying to live to. You do not have to try to live to victory. You have to come from a place of victory. And how that begins is how you see Christ. I'm telling you prophetically, I don't care how bad that you fail. His success is greater than your greatest failure. Not only his death to get it off of you, but his confidence and our confidence in him in his life. Listen, we all have the faith to believe he can forgive us of our sins. Can we shift it over now to begin to believe that we can trust him in our future? that he can lead us and guide us in the place of truth and righteousness and the plans that he has for us are good. They're right. And we can walk this thing out together and he has that spouse for you. He has that job and career for you. He has that next business arrangement for you. He has that city set up for you. He has that church for you, that ministry for you, whatever it is that you're looking for, those children coming back into your life and your future. They're, he has a set up for you. Can you trust that his victory is so potent and so powerful that it cannot stop any decision that you make that sets you back on your rear end. He will not leave you back on your rear end. His victory comes to you, pulls you back up out of your rear end, and leads you into the place of victory again. That's what I'm trying to get you to see. If we'll quit trying to worry about not failing, we can learn to live in a place of victory. Can you lead as a king on the throne with him, not always having to have adversity in your life? What happens if the one million addiction, people in addictions all across this country, one million plus or whatever the number was I just recently heard, a million people addicted, it's probably a lot more than that, obviously, but let's just say it's a million people. What happens if the Spirit of God baptizes every one of those people in an, inst in an instant? Gone. Whoa. Eyes opened. Freedom. You're not going to fail. Never no relapse. You're done. You're, you're, heading, no way. You're, you're moving on. What happens? How can I do this? Can we trust that he'll lead us into the place that he called us? Or does he have to always leave us in a place of battle? My, I'm telling you that the Spirit of God in the climate of this country has shifted the atmosphere in the United States of America. And you're going to begin to see some things happening in schools, in colleges, in government, in, 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 in business, economic. You're going to see some things that are happening right here. And there are going to be things that you have prayed for in your life to see happen. 
But you've got to see that you're not disconnected from living in it. You've got to engage in living in it. And you can trust yourself engaging in culture and things of your dreams because you're not going to fail. You're not going to fail. Well, what if I mess up? Get up and go again. The righteous fell seven times, the Bible says, and Solomon wrote it. The righteous fall, but they keep getting back up. See, I'm telling you, we have got to come from a place of, if it's the last thing, the last sermon that I preach in my life, I got to cry out to an entire church people that you are not coming from a place of defeat. We've got to live and see through eyes and view of victory. We have already won the battle. It's overcome by the blood of the Lamb and now the word of our testimony. We are overcomers in Him. There's nothing else He can do that He's already not done but die and then resurrect. Our job now is to connect into what He has already provided and let it become a greater reality than the fear and worry and concern of everyday living. And somehow, supernaturally, the, the, the faith that we have in his victory supersedes all of our concern and worry when we begin to focus on that and not on this. But when you focus on this, he gets eclipsed and your life becomes a mountain that you have to overcome. That when he becomes your mountain, life gets eclipsed by his being the mountain, and now you've already overcome. <laughs> you got to see this. I'm telling you, we can't spend the rest of our life of, of, of trying to figure out how to get people out of their jams. Am I okay with that? We can't. We'll, all we will do is repair, repair, repair. I'm just telling you, guys here on the front row, we got to go. We got to get going. We got stuff to do. You got things, plans he has for you. We got to go. There's a future out here bright. I'm just telling you that you can't fail. We start moving this direction. One of them stumbles. What do we do? Do we stop living to go back and say, hey, we're going to pick you up? No. Get up off yourself. Quit thinking about that. Let's go. We got to move forward. Somebody goes through a divorce. Maybe they didn't cause it. Maybe it was something happened out of their control. I don't know. But we love on them in the moment. But do we sit there for the next two years and let them feel sorry for themselves while the world passes them by? No. Get up off yourself. Morning lasts for just a short time. It's time to get up and let's time to go. You didn't cause it. Let's get up and go. Let me take it a step further. You caused it. Let's get up and go. All right. See, we're waiting on the perfect one to come because we have this mindset that the perfect one is coming back. So we wait in our imperfection, waiting on the perfect one to come to get us perfected. The perfect one has already come. He left you here imperfect to rely on him that is perfect. Now let's go do this thing. Let's build a business. Let's build a church. Let's go back to school. Let's restore our kids. Let's do whatever it's called to do. Whatever that thing is inside of you that God placed, step out and do it. And the only thing that stops you from here to there is fear and all the reasons why it won't work. And I don't care why it don't work. I don't care why you're afraid. I'll hug you for a moment, then I'm going to kick you in the rear end to get you going. We got to go somewhere. There's a country at stake. There's 25 kids downstairs eating, eating Krispy Kreme donuts that are depending on us to show them how to live from victory and not in defeat. Are you hearing what I'm saying? This isn't a battle, child support or no child support. This is about, a, this is about young people growing up. Brian's got a, a dozen or so youth, young people, expression teens, up there ministering right now, teaching them real life living, going through the change of life in their life, physically, emotionally, going through that. Young people, they're tough. Teenagers are tough. You guys know what I'm talking about. It's tough to live that life, and it's tough to raise children in teenage years because they're having through an identity issue. I got news for you. The body of Christ has gone from that teenage year, we're in the young adult stage. It's time to make some career moves. Right? I'm going to be really, really honest with you here. This isn't romper room anymore. 
We don't have time for children's church in the adult church. Lord. People are looking at the clock now. They're they're telling me to get off here. I can tell. We don't have time for children's church in the adult church. Why? Because three million of them didn't vote last time. And I'm not telling you who to vote for. I'm not telling you that. I'm not giving you some political speech. I'm just telling you, if you don't vote, don't complain. And if you don't attend church, this is not for you all, but you can take it to somebody that cares. If you don't attend church, you don't have a voice in complaining about the church. You see what I mean? If you're not, if you've never been there, you forfeit your voice to, to talk like you have. Right? Now, here's the deal. Over the next three weeks, what I'm going to speak on is we're going to learn as Jesus came on the scene 2,000 years ago, we're going to learn to how to receive his love and learn how to receive his grace, right? It's not something we can just say. It's something that we have to incorporate inside of us and absorb into the fabric of who we are. I've heard of all the, the people who talk about the, the gay lifestyle. And I heard, I talked to one not too long ago, the guy was in a homosexual relationship. He said, God loves me the way I am. I said, he loves you right where you are. I know. But if you will learn how to receive the love from him right where you are, something begins to change in you that you begin to transform that I can't explain to you. So my responsibility is not to say that God doesn't love you right where you are, because he does. And he loves you just the way you are. But if you'll learn to receive it, you'll change. And that's no different than a hard-headed, stubborn man that's got a wife and a couple of kids that isn't homosexual, that watches Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon football, that thinks he's got it all together and is masculine, but he's sitting there stubborn as a mule and telling me that God loves him just like he is. He does. But if you receive the love of God, you'll be transformed. Because his goal to us is for us to become more like him. I don't have to try to be Christ. I let Christ be in me, which is the hope of the only glory there is. So we begin to transform. So it's not I'm put, I don't have to try to be kind or act kind. I am kind. I don't have to act like I love people. I love people. I don't have to act nice. I am nice. We go from something that we put on to something that we become. And that comes in two ways, receiving the grace and receiving the love of God. And as that becomes more in your life incorporated as receiving it, it changes who you are. You can try to do better without receiving that first, but you'll live a conditional life. And if I do receive, if I receive God's love conditionally with strings attached, then I'll love Rocky conditionally with strings attached. So when Rocky goes out here and lets me down, I'm hurt and disappointed, and it hurts me. And I'm thinking, man, I can't, have, I can't let myself vulnerable anymore. Why? Because he let me down. Why is that happening? Because I really believe if I go out and disappoint God, I've let him down. Across vertical and horizontal, unconditional this direction, unconditional this direction. But there is no this direction without first this direction. Are we ready to receive it? We're part of the end time generation of people. I'm not joking. But the end time. I put this title up there. Here he comes. H-E-A-R. He's coming back one day. But my God. Do we want to look at him and say, hurry and get us out of this mess? Do I have to worship like David worshipped always in a mess? You know what I'm talking about? David was high and low, man. He was running from people, fighting people had an affair, messed up, thought he was dying. And every time David worshipped in desperation, David worshipped like David worshipped, like David worshipped was so powerful. And the church today is going, we want David's worship. Man, I want Solomon's wisdom. Don't you? When you're sitting there and you're in a life situation, and all of a sudden, the Lord drops something in your spirit by discerning, and you get the wisdom of Solomon, and you go, oh, thank you, Lord. 
and it discerns and it cuts through the soul and the spirit and it accelerates you into the things of the spirit like you've never seen before, then when that begins to materialize in your life, you're not worshiping like David worshiped. You worship like David wished he had a worship because you're coming from a place of victory, not from a place of defeat. Stand to your feet. This is powerful stuff if we can get a hold of this. And you, you gotta know something. The Lord let you be alive in 2014, going into 216 and 217, and, and for 15 and 16 and 17, because we're going to be, the church is going to be the barometer in the earth. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? It's not gonna be the Muslims. It's not gonna be ISIS, even though they're gonna be out there. It's not gonna be all of, the, it's, it's not gonna be the, the politicians. It's gonna be the church. God's positioning people in places. I heard the Lord say just now, there's people in here that should be running for some governmental official. You should be running for an office in your area, whether it be city, county, or state, I don't know, but somebody, the Lord's already placed it up on your heart to run for it, and you decided, I don't know if that's the Lord or not. I'm telling you, the Lord's gonna raise you up for that, and he'll bring you confirmation in to run for that office that the Lord's telling you to do. Watch and see it doesn't happen. And all I'm asking you to do is do it. You're not gonna fail. Listen to me. You're a part of a victorious body of people. This is not a pep rally. This is something that really we have the goods to back up. Man, how would you have liked to have been the year before Jesus came and somebody tell you this message? You're the chosen ones. You're gonna do this. And you didn't even have the blood on your back. Now you got the blood applied to your back. You've got the victorious death, the victorious burial, and the victorious resurrection already working in your life. Let's go do this thing. What is it this week stands between you and victory and success between now and next Sunday? Is it your fear of failure? Your concern and your worry? How about you do this? Trust yourself this week that he's not gonna let you fail. And if you're not getting knocked down and do something silly and crazy, get back up and know that you got another day to go. Keep on going. Don't quit, keep moving, go fast, go ahead. Let those things behind be behind and move on to those things that are ahead of you because God has great things and expect Him to do things you can't do for yourself. The impossible blessings of the Lord will chase you down when you're fixated on His resurrected life and not focus on your powerless bad decisions that you might make every day. It's His way, it's not our way. He is the way, He is the truth, and He brings us all of His life in resurrected power, in Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Come on, lift it up today. Sing Savior. Somebody just give the Lord a great big hand clap of praise for his victory that leads us and causes us to triumph in all things. We're raising up a generation of young people, children all the way up, nursery workers, nursery kids in the nursery, people that are pregnant, that babies will be born. Wombs that have not yet been opened to have the baby, but the wombs are gonna be open to have the baby. Babies that you don't even know that are in there that he already knows that are in there. That's why we're making decisions we're making. That's why we're directing and navigating the church the way we're navigating. A church that's victorious, that's not afraid to take a risk, but yet rest, trusting in him that even if we mess it up along the way, he knows how to take it and turn it into something good for our future. Because he can be trusted, because he knows the covenant that he has with himself. He made it between him and himself and it cannot be broken. Man can't interfere with it. Man never made it and man can't stop it because God did it all himself. 
Next week, we're going to baptize everybody and anybody who wants to be baptized. If you've been baptized before and you feel being baptized again into new life, not just into your, away from your old stuff, but into your new life, we'll baptize you next Sunday. We're going to talk about what the plan is over the next 12 months and how we're going to get there. And then we're going to talk about how we get into Romans chapter 6 and 7 and how we can be prepared to live this thing out, not afraid to fail, but embracing his victory. Father, in Jesus' name, we bless your people in this first service here in this building, and we thank you, God, for what you're doing. From this day forward, we will focus on your overcoming power in Jesus' name. And everybody shout it, amen, amen, amen. The world needs to know how you are.